Hello again. Uh, the last talk before the break. Uh, let's meet the next speaker, Scala programmer for over 10 years. We can also say that they have the same roots. Jakob Poderski will tell us a story about a cryptogra cryptographer on a date with Dottie. He will explain how this love grew up at Infer Company. Jakob will answer all of your questions during the uh, Q&A session just after the talk. Jakob, you can start your presentation now. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Maya. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about how at uh, my company we have adopted Dotty uh, uh, about last year, actually, mid last year. And um, bit, well, I'll talk a bit about it, our experiences uh, using it. But uh, first, I'll show you what we have actually used it for and specifically what new features from uh, what is now Scala 3 we have used. So to give a bit of background, um, I work at a company called Infa. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're building a system that allows us to model and run privacy preserving computations, specifically something called multi-party computations, also known as MPC. In MPC, the goal is to evaluate a function on private input um, now and, and get that, that result shared to someone who's evaluating it. Now, the key thing to note here is that the inputs must remain private always, even between the parties involved in a computation. Um, so this involves some kind of uh, protocols to evaluate some, uh, some primitives. You can think of it uh, logically that we are basically separating the computation and asking different entities to run different parts. And then there's this whole communication protocol involved. Now, for some... Uh, low-level operations, there are well-known protocols. Um, and we have at Info, we've built a virtual machine which can run these protocols. Now, the key, the, the challenge is composing them. If you can only evaluate an addition or multiplication, you can't get very far in real life. Uh, real life being typically data analytics, uh, machine learning, et cetera. So we have built a compiler that allows us to compose these high-level uh, descriptions in a uh, very user-friendly API that looks pretty much like, so you're gonna work with linear algebra, it's gonna have some aspects of like MATLAB or any kind of um, uh, linear algebra library. Uh, another important aspect from the compiler is of course to verify that the code, these protocols we generate are correct and try to optimize them as much as possible. Um, and you're, you might've guessed that this compiler, this language is going to be the focus of this talk today. Um, but before we get that to that, I should also say something about the, the people who work at Infra, right? So we have a multitude of uh, backgrounds. Some people, of course, are from software engineering, but a lot of people have a background in cryptography or other disciplines, often some other mathematical disciplines. Um, this is sometimes challenging to make, to build a, a DSL for them. But uh, the story today I'll tell you is how we made that possible and what our experiences were. So just to situate this, uh, this whole talk, in not last year, it's already been almost two years now. Uh, in 2019, my colleague Manohan and I gave a talk about how our initial version worked. So at this point, we had an external DSL, so a standalone language that allowed, uh, allowed us to express these MPC programs. Uh, if you're interested, check out the Scala Days 2019 talk. We'll also go into some more detail on how MPC works, which I'm, not, which I'm gonna skip over in this talk for the sake of time. Today, I'm gonna talk about how we moved this external DSL into an embedded DSL. And finally, hopefully um, this year or maybe next year, or I don't know when Scala Days is going to happen next, uh, my colleague and I will be giving a talk about uh, um, diving more into details about the whole, um, how the whole privacy preserving algorithm library that we built uh, works, focusing more. Today, I'm just going to look at, at the Scala features, uh, at some of an, a subset of the Scala features we've used for building a user-friendly DSL. So no, nothing today is actually going to be related to our actual DSL. Today is just examples. So the first thing to ask is why did we move from an external DSL, which we already had last year, as I said, to an embedded one. So of course, um, uh, the, 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 the reason is the most interesting and also the hardest parts of working 
on an, uh, a domain-specific language usually involves some intermediate representation. So we're not so much focused on the syntax, but rather what, what it semantically means and operations on them. So this is where all the work then from a compiler, all the heavy lifting comes in, in static analysis. So things like optimizing what you're trying to do, verifying that your algorithm is actually uh, preserve, is keeping visibilities as you, as you expect them. Um, so, uh, and in, uh, if you're working in an external DSL, you need to do this, but you also, of course, need to work on all the front end things like parsing, uh, in, adding new concepts that users want. And that's, of course, it's possible, but it takes a lot of time and it's not really relevant for the problem at hand. It's not really well suited unless you have an infinite amount of resources and time. So we decided to take our embedded D our external DSL and make it embedded. At the time, it was, I think, .e025 or something like that. And we decided, um, hey, why not use that for our embedded DSL? <clears throat> so let's talk about building this DSL. So first of all, what were the goals we wanted to get to? So of course, we wanted to make it simple to read, um, but also to write. Basically, examples should speak by, to them, by themselves, and then users should be able to tweak examples and continue work. Uh, they should also be able to quickly find and fix things by themselves without being an expert in Skype. This means that error messages are extremely important, sometimes actually so much that we decided to go with a dynamic approach and said we will uh, forego type safety for error messages which are more descriptive. Now here we should note that we have a something called a stage to DSL. So our internal structure is decoupled from the syntax. This means that the runtime errors are sort of compile time errors because they're happening while we're basically evaluating our intermediate trees. They're just not happening at Scala compile time, but they're happening before we're executing anything on top of these trees. So it's a good trade. And finally, uh, what you should also note is that, I mean, users, they're there to get the job done. They're not necessarily gonna care how you th do things inside. And, you know, the, this conference is called Scala Love. It's okay to love Scala, but you shouldn't fall in love with your own code. So the approach we took, as I said, is we decoupled the structure from the user level API. Uh, what does this mean? This means we, in, in other words, this is also called staging. So we have this intermediate representation, which I'll just talk about in a second. Uh, it allows plugging in basically different backends. And in this talk, we're gonna focus on how we get from a user level API to the structure. We're not gonna talk about what we do with the structure, which is actually the interesting and difficult things, but here it's, it's a DSL talk. So we're talking about some of the, the tips and tricks to get from user level to stage representation. And what we also wanted to do in our approach was to make it very easy to find where things are. And this was of course in the goal to make it easy for users to, to, um, to edit code and, and try to understand what, what's happening. So let's look at an example of a language that is very similar to the one we have at Infer. So this, um, a couple of things to note here. Uh, actually, line two, this is, you see the red underline. I've heard Dotty has recently changed the import syntax to be something more like Python. Not sure if this is actually the case. So uh, the commented outline is the thing you need to use for now. But line two, if that happens, is going to be much nicer to read. Anyway. So um, let's look at, at, at this code a little bit here. So some things that are noteworthy. Uh, first of all, you need to know, so we're dealing with a privacy preserving, like an M privacy preserving uh, framework. So the concept of a data set is our central point. A data set is basically some data that belongs to different parties. Different parties can see different parts of it. Uh, there's a, a lot to it, but for now think of it as just some, some container which on which you can work in a functional manner. So it's a sort of a collection. You can map over it as you see. Um, uh, another thing to, to note in, in, another two things to note that are, that are important and we'll get to is looking at line 12, this debug statement. What is that? Um, we'll see how this integrates. It's actually not just something that you can write anywhere. It's something specific to this. It's like a sub DSL, if you will. Um, in, line 16 to 19, you'll notice we are combining data sets in without using tuples or pattern matching. And we'll explain how this is possible. But basically what we're doing in, in general here is building this 
this, uh, this graph that combines data flows from some inputs to others. Here, we're just printing it, but because again, this is, uh, we're not interested in how things are evaluated in this talk. Um, let's look at the structure. So what you saw here, this is the user facing API. What you see here is the end goal. This is internally how things are represented. There are two concepts, one data set, which corresponds to basically a variable. And then there's a built-in which corresponds to, it's the closest to an abstract syntax tree if you're familiar with compilers. It corresponds to kind of the fabric of the, of what we're trying, you know, of, of how we will model the computation. And you see, we're already using one feature, enum. I mean, again, it's 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 not very, uh, it's not such a, a a novel or difficult to understand idea here. It's basically replacing sealed traits with a bunch of uh, in, in instances. Um, so the three concepts, the th the three built-ins we have in in this mini language is one is to to read some data, um, one is to map over inputs, and one is to map over to 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 run to run a secure multi-party computation on some inputs. So things to note that are important here are built-ins have inputs. These things they reference other data sets. So again, this is this this idea of being a data set being a variable that we can later evaluate. The other thing is this function. So you'll notice if you're familiar with how things are how how you usually represent a map, it's often from uh, your your container, your, the type of your container that's inside your container to some other type. Here you'll notice, so we have that with partition. Um, we're talking about a sequence of partitions just to generalize the map. That's not super important right now. What's important to note is this extra parameter, this context thing. That'll come in, uh, be important later on because there are many situations in which you actually care about where um, the runtime characteristics of where your map is actually going to be executed. So you're going to want a way to access that, but only on demand. And I'll get to that in just a second. And finally, in the MPC case, uh, you'll notice there's this MPC context passed in. And what we're doing is we're working on something called here, fixed point. Now, what is this? This is in the MPC world. This is MPC, remember, is a specific type of privacy preserving computations. There, we can only work with fixed point numbers. We cannot work with arbitrary with, with other data types. So basically, it's a, it's a specialized uh, specialized version um, of, of the, the general partition type we have. And of course, in MPC, we can only work on that. Um, so in, in our structure, we need to model it in the specific, uh, the most specific type. But again, in user syntax, we will want, um, we will want a nicer API in which we can basically treat a partition as a fixed point in an MPC context. Okay, so now that we have, uh, we've seen what the thing looks like and we've seen uh, the, the goal, let's try to work backwards and see the different Scala concepts we can use to, to bridge these, th these two uh, worlds. So the three con the concepts I'll talk about today are top level functions, context functions, and if I have time, uh, the new metaprogramming API. Again, out of scope is what we do with a stage representation. Once we've reached that, we're done. First concept is very short. Uh, Scala 3 now has top level functions, uh, which basically almost all other languages do, but Scala did not, and uh, because Java does not either. It's, uh, it's almost trivial. Um, it does have some nice advantages. There's no indirection. It's basically as direct as you can get. Um, and how, how we then basically bridge from the user level API defined as top level functions to our staged API is pretty straightforward. We just initialize the object. So that's a very, very simple. Second concept is where it already gets much more interesting, but you'll see they combine very nicely with top level functions. So that's why I mentioned them. So the second concept is context functions. What are context functions? They are basically functions that have implicit parameters. And if you're interested, you can read about it more in, in, this, in this link here. Um, let's see, what does it mean to have implicit parameters? I think the, the best way to show this is through an example. So assume we have this, um, actually, let me open this pointer thing here. So I hope you can see a little red dot on my screen. So anything above the dot is going to be what we're gonna look at now. And then below is a, is a second version of this. 
So let's look at this very simple API. We have something in which we want to build some kind of graph. So we have a function called build graph that, that takes itself a, a, as a parameter function that give, injects a builder and allows the user to do something with it. And one of the things we can do with it is this add edge function. Um, again, implementations are not important here. So we're just talking about the, the, syn uh, the, the, the syntax. And then pretty straightforward, uh, you can basically call build graph with the builder inside your code uh, injected and you just uh, add your edges here. Now, the, if we change this to a context function, so what are the things that change? Actually, just two things. One of them is you need to add this strange new syntax here. You need to add a question mark before the arrow in your build graph function. This basically makes f a context function, makes the builder that will be injected an implicit parameter. And then, of course, in the uh, add edge where you're going to use the builder, you need to specify your builder parameter as implicit. And this way, you can write the code uh, as you see down here. Now, for single single level builders, this is not so interesting. You don't gain that much. But where this gets more interesting is imagine now you had nested things. So imagine you have a uh, library to build HTML tags and you want to basically have something that, uh, that has an HTML top level function and inside you want you know, your head and then next to it you want a body and inside of it you can have your paragraphs, your divs, whatever you want. Um, in this case, it becomes very interesting to not have to pass out around this explicit builder object everywhere. So this shows you what implicit functions allow you to do. Now, how we use them are actually in, in two different uh, aspects and in two different ways. Um, the first one is to access contextual information quickly without changing surrounding code. So this is perfect for debugging. So here will be a motivating example. As you saw before in the map operation we have on data sets, the, this, what does this represent? It represents some function that will be executed on different entities of this computation. Now these entities, they will most likely not be on your local machine, they will be running somewhere else. So that means if you want to throw in a quick print line to debug something, well, that's going to go out to the other machines and it's never gonna come back to you who submitted the application. So what we could do instead is we could define in this map context, so this is something that the runtime will actually implement, some, some mechanism to debug, to print a message and, and return it back to us. Now, what we would like to do is we would like to call this code without having to change anything that's surrounding. So the first way in which this can be done is we implement our map function as always. Here, we do not have access to the surrounding context. And we create an overload, basically, um, that does accept the context. Now, what's annoying here is that the user needs to change code surrounding it. So if they wanted to transform the code above, map without this context to something that does use it, you need to change things around it. And that's, of course, it's not a huge uh, pain point, but it is a kind of annoying if you just, if you just really want to, want to print this message. Another way to, to work around this is actually through the use of these context functions. So one of them is, uh, one way to do this is to basically specify a debug method, which takes a, uh, an implicit context, just forwards it to the, the context, um, and then redefine our map function to actually always have a map context as a context function. So what does this mean? This means that it allows the user to now just call debug when they want to. And if they don't want to, they don't need to change anything. They can just comment out that code or remove it. And there's nothing else to do. Now, debugging is one simple example. You can, of course, imagine you have many more complex things defined on your environment. So this is one way to use context functions. The other one where it gets much more interesting is how to compose actually different abstractions, different, different levels of abstractions in your language. And one example we have here from our language is that in general, the high level language allows you to express privacy preserving flows, but it also has its own specialized tools for only MPC. Concretely in, in the examples I showed you before, what does it mean? It means the high level language is what you saw the map defined on, the multi-party defined on, that's working on the data set. 
but what you what wasn't shown so much was that let me go go up to this thing here inside of this multi-party block in here you're working with different types you see it's fixed point you're basically in a different DSL almost. You're working on different data types. And how do you transition between these two worlds? This is actually the second use case of uh, composing abstraction uh, of uh, context functions. So as I said, right, within an MPC computation, partitions must always be viewed as fixed point types. So one way this can actually be modeled is again with context functions. So let's look at it here. So in what do, what do we need to do is, let's look at how this multi-party block is defined. It's basically just a function that takes in a context function that has an, a multi-party uh, context, gives you back a fixed point. And the second part to it is in a data set, we need to define an apply method that will basically, in view of a context, give us a representation of this data set as a fixed point partition. Um, I'll get to some, some more advanced things you could do. You, I'll mention some more advanced things in, in a second with this, but for now, we're working with a fixed type here. So MPC context gives you back MPC fixed point. And just with something as simple as this, it allows you to write code that looks like this down here, down below the line. So assuming two data sets, I can now combine them as I like. And inside of this multi-party block, I can build my own DSL. I can it's a whole other universe that opens here. Now you can imagine taking it another step further is making, instead of using static types here, an MPC context and an MPC fixed point, you can make the return type dependent on the context you have in here. And this way basically allow users to plug in new contexts for new data types and have their own new nested DSLs. One note with this feature, it's kind of powerful. We're talking about you know, injecting implicits and what happens when an implicit isn't found. It's a huge pain point in Scala, specifically when you're working with DSLs, if, if something doesn't go wrong. And remember one of our goals was to always have nice error messages. So the first thing is uh, we get that for free out of the box. Scala 3 supports uh, much nicer error messages when implicits aren't found. It will actually suggest where things could be found what you might need to import, um, bring into your scope. But another actually much more lower hanging solution is that you can define implicit not found annotation on your context objects. And this allows you, because you're designing a language, you should also say, you should also just specify errors and, and just say where things are allowed to use or not. And you can do that very easily. You just add an implicit not found annotation to this context. And if you try to use a function that expects a context somewhere where there isn't one, you can throw in a very easily understandable error. In this case saying, look, this debug in operation is not allowed outside of a map. Okay, so I do have three minutes to talk about this and then I need to go on to the next section. Um, one thing to note with context functions is I, they allow you to, on a, on a type level, to bridge between different uh, DSLs. So between the, the high level DSL and the, the inner one. Um, what they do not allow you to do is work to, is uh, basically syntactically determine what your inputs are and lift them so that they can be included in your outer structure. So concretely, what does it mean? It means I have an MPC I want to get an MPC dependency, if you remember in our build things. An MPC dependency expects a list of inputs that must explicitly be specified so that later on, when I'm working with my graph, I can actually traverse it and find what the actual inputs have been. However, in code, you do not specify inputs as a list. You specify them naturally as basically just a reference to some outside variable. So context cannot help you there. You need to use metaprogramming. You need to inspect your code just to find what outside inputs you're referring to so that you can basically uh, mark them and add them as an input in your, in your stage DSL. So to do this, you can use the, the new macros in Scala. Again, here there's a link if you're interested in checking them out. A uh, couple things to note about the new macros, which are really, really interesting. 
Uh, first of all, they are hygienic. So this means you can, you don't need to worry about name clashes. You can, you don't need to worry about constructing strings uh, with correct names, trying to put them back into your, uh, into your expansion sites. It all just works out of the box. And the other thing, which is also a huge usability improvement is you can, def you can use macros in the same place, in the same project as you define them. So no more creating dedicated macro project, um, working around, you know, trying to find where is what it's really, you can just define it next to your declaration of the macro. How do macros look like? There, I have to go very quickly now, I'm sorry. Uh, you declare them with an inline keyword. This is pretty similar to how you did it previously in Scala. There was no inline keyword, but you declare them and you implement them separately. Uh, macros, one thing you will note is the, any parameters you give it will become in the implementation an expression of something. So this, this just represents what uh, the, the expression, basically the tree of the parameter, not the value of the parameter. And then there's this thing called quoting and splicing, which allows you to, to treat an exp uh, a Scala, Scala construct, a Scala, um, something that's written in Scala and take it as, a, as its uh, tree, pass it to the macro. So this basically allows you to transform FN, so this thing here, into an expression. Splicing, on the other hand, does the opposite. It takes the expression and moves it back into regular Scala. Um, and as I said, so macros will be used to bridge, to bridge the world between uh, syntax and structure. Um, one, I'm, I don't have time to go into details. What thing, what happens here? One thing to note is is just this uh, this quoted. Bracket, uh, bracket this this block here in the end. Um, this looks like it's regular, just regular, you know, syntax you would write if you're day-to-day -day programming in Scala, and it actually is. Except what will happen is when this macro is expanded, this code here is going to get plugged into wherever you you your the macro is expanded, and this is this is very powerful. But itself, this is all checked at compile time as well, so you would not be able to inject any code that itself is not a valid Scala program. <clears throat> um, yes, this, finally, one thing I do want to mention here. So again, macros, they, they allowed us to uh, detect in the inputs so that we can put them, take them out of our syntax, move them into our structure. Now with this current implementation, we're still limited to one output, but there is a, actually a much more interesting advanced feature of white box macros, which we could use to uh, make the output type determined uh, dependent on the input type. This would allow us to have full arbitrary graph mapping, uh, as you can see in this example, where we take two inputs and two outputs. Um, but again, this is a very powerful, and I'd say use this with caution. We have it in one place in our DSL, and it's, I'm not sure if it will stay. We might be able to actually use something much simpler you not even going through macros, but using uh, just regular inline constructs in Scala. Um, so those are, were the three main constructs. A couple just uh, miscellaneous things I would want to mention is import renames are always great. Just for code clarity, it's often easier to import just maybe two things and then refer to them with a prefix rather than importing a bunch of things from unrelated packages. Uh, finally, union types can help you avoid naming altogether if you need them. Um, if you're interested in, in seeing what, uh, how this DSL works that I put, to, uh, I put together this example uh, repo here, you can check it out. It contains all the snippets. Uh, one thing as well as alternatives, of course, what we described here is not, not something super novel. There are different approaches in which you can do it. Uh, one, one of them is you could do this, have the same effect of top level declarations with context functions. You can do that. What's often talked about in the Scala community, the cake pattern. Um, there, the, the disadvantage is that the inheritance of the cake pattern introduce, makes it more complex to find where things are defined. So specifically, if you're an outsider to a library, it just, it's much more complex to, to find where things are. Um, then the, how do you de decouple code and the structure? Of course, there's a lot out there. Uh, how do you build basically an interpreter? This is, you'll see many talks, a free monad. How do you, how do you design something there? Um, and that's definitely an option as well, except here macros just 
work again because they work on the syntax level they allow you to forego a lot of the kind of um mind bending you sometimes need to do or unraveling of the the monad style and these constructs they work very well uh of course they're i would say they probably work uh, better if people already know scala and kind of know what to expect here macros we can really try to mimic a language that that looks very uh, declarative very straightforward okay finally um, I hope I can go maybe five minutes over time. I hope that's okay, Maya, and then we take it off. Um, I think there is a longer break before uh, the next talks, so maybe uh, maybe three or four, maybe five minutes. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> I um, I do want to talk a little bit about the experiences. So now you know I've, I've talked about the DSL, and I do want to talk just about the experiences we've had. You know, as a company adopting. Uh, adopting Dotty and using it in, in, in this DSL. So the first thing to notice, so we've used since the beginning, it's, it's a heterogeneous um, repository that we have. So it's not purely Scala. There's uh, quite a lot of Python in there as well. Um, a lot of it is involved for testing. So we've used mill as our build tool for, for we've had, it's been super easy to integrate it with external tools. For example, we have PyTest for anything that's not pure Scala. So we were comparing some outputs of Python code and, and what we have in Scala. They work very well together. As editor, we have uh, kind of used VS Code. It was mostly historical because our external language um, had its own syntax highlighting that we implemented in VS Code. Sure, IntelliJ is great too. With Metals, we've had um, almost no problems. Of course, again, because we were you know, on the, the bleeding edge, a couple times we did run into incompatibilities where it it wasn't ever a work blocker and as long as you never re-imported your build when you upgrade after you had upgraded dotty everything was mostly okay um dotty itself we had a couple small uh issues that we encountered we actually reported a few bugs uh helped help fix them uh, the they were mostly related they were kind of minor but mostly related to some issues with top level functions, um, mostly it's just some name clashes. And then of course, the, the biggest, I would say, uh, hurdle was the ecosystem lagging behind. Again, that is to be expected if you're working on, a, on using a completely new, eco, a new language. Um, the binary compatibility with Scala 2.13 project has never been a problem at all. So we would just, if we had any dependency that was published with Scala 2.13, we could just use that as is except of course projects that have macros. So those, for those, we did need to spend some time porting them. Um, and we did uh, port, uh, spend quite some effort in porting a lot of the, uh, the projects from Howie, um, we call it the Singaporean stack, which are a great, great suite of projects I can highly recommend. So those are mostly just our dependencies. Finally, for the, I would say the, the our users, um, of course, people who were coming new to the language needed some handholding in the beginning. But this is as is with every any language, uh, with any project, not nothing specific to Scala. Um, the lack of documentation on Scala 3 in that sense was not a major problem. It, because they, we, we helped that uh, we needed to introduce them anyway. Um, of course, some things of Scala did need explanation, mostly the, the new syntax changes, right? So, the difference using given what is this what is the question mark arrow operator but there wasn't anything where people would be like hey you know what well, this is weird after we explained it this is strange in fact actually the most uh, contentious i'd say discussions we have are not related to scala syntax but to internal syntax and how we name things um and also speaking of syntax we use scala fmt um i know it's almost ready as far as i know but still sometimes it hangs up and uh, again, I know, you know, Dottie has been changing syntax quickly. Scala FMT can't, can't keep up with that as quickly either. So there's sometimes we need to just disable Scala FMT. It's not the end of the world either though. And um, of course we work with non-Scala experts. So we always need to make sure that, you know, our front end is really solid before we make it available. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's less uh, sympathy, let's say for something going wrong, which again is understandable. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you for listening. Um, a little over time.
Again, if you are interested in the snippets, uh, check out this library. Um, come to our Scala Days talk whenever that's going to happen. We'll have much more information. And uh, I want to say thank you to my colleague Manahar, with whom we built this uh, this library, and who also went over my slides. Thanks. <laughs>